This is Hannibal here from the HannibalTV.com, and we're we're live a few minutes late, I guess, due to Paul Roma, who is, uh, <laughs> who is friends with Mario Mancini and had him on the phone. I guess he's at the wrestling school. Yeah, uh, Wednesday nights his night to teach. Um, you know, I, I blew Roma's mind on New Year's Eve because I said, you know, Roma, it's going to be 2023. And he said, yeah, I go, you know what next year is? He goes, no, what? I go, 40 years. He goes, oh, my God. He goes, yeah, that's right, 40 years. So I've been with the Roman a long time, man. I know it's a disparity, you know, the tag team partner of uh, Hercules Hernandez and uh, one of the four horsemen there, but but we are we are brothers. We're very close. So <laughs> Paul Roman, Mario Mancini, right? Paul Orndorff's uh, partner too. Yeah, yeah, both times uh, tag team champions. Once with uh, Orndorff, and uh, once with um, with Arn Anderson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would they even? Consider the Paula chant appropriate anymore now with, with how sensitive everyone is. I know that Paul Roma didn't get as, as much as Orndorff, but uh, this fan's bringing it up. Yeah. Yeah, I don't... I I remember the, the last time I heard... Uh, I don't even know if I could say it, but the derogatory F word towards homosexuals uh, was around... 2005 and at an event in Calgary, they were cheering it at Honky Tonk Man's opponent during a match. And I remember standing beside Lance Storm, who was like in disbelief that in 2005 uh, fans were chanting that. But it, but in some areas, uh, they're less sensitive than others, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, you know, it happens, unfortunately, still. Um I saw my brother Joe Bruin pop up here. What's going on, Joe? I can't wait until July, man. Can't wait until July. New England Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame. And you know what? I don't – I'm going to have to do some talking to Joe because, you know, he said that's the last one. And um, I, I don't know how that can be. But, uh, listen, I know he's busy. I know he's got a lot of kids and – you know, I know he's getting older now, and in 2013, actually, with 10 years ago, Joe Bruin invited me to the Hall of Fame there, to the Fan Fest, and then he inducted me the next year in 2014. But 10 years went by quick. It was fast. <laughs> but, um, you know, I hope it's not the last one. You know, I hope Joe Bruin is like a professional wrestler, you know what I mean? Because I had my last match in 2021 in november um that was my retirement match and and you know i was 55 so um you know hopefully joe will be sitting there after a couple of years and it'll still be in his blood and somehow he'll want to still do it so because it's it it is one of the best times i have and it, it really is a good kind of it, it's a good fan fest it's a great hall of fame um so I, I, I'm, I'm, it's going to break my heart not to do that thing. You know what I mean? It broke my heart during COVID not to do it. So, but uh, hopefully Mr. Bruin will, he'll st still have the bug. So Hannibal it was a good session in the gym. Yeah, it was, but, but hopefully he'll just take a year off. They don't necessarily have to have it every year. Well, no, it's true. But you know what? Bruin, Bruin said it's the last one. So you know what I mean? So, you know, Joe, I got to tell you, Joe, Joe sticks to his guns. And and I've never seen anybody intimidate him. I can remember, which I still need to go face to face with Hogan and tell him thanks a lot. Thanks for nothing. Uh, but I remember being in a line. Hogan was in Rhode Island. And, he, and Joe asked me to come up to see if I could ask him to be, because uh, Hogan knows me pretty well, to be in the Hall of Fame, to, to go to be in a fan fest or whatever. And Jimmy Hart saw me, and he's like, hey, Mario, what's up, baby? And I was talking to Hogan, and there was a long line. And they're like, you got to move it along. I go, I just got to ask him a question. He's like, what's up, Eminem? I go, oh, Terry, listen, this is Joe Bruin over here. You got to move it along. 
I'm like, I just want to ask him a question. Well, I almost got thrown out of the place, and Hogan just kept his head down. And I'm like, Terry. And he just kept his head down. So I'd like to run into him for that and remind him of that and say thanks. Because believe it or not, that's happened to me before. But I had such a good friend in front of me. I said, get behind me. I go, get out of line and get behind me and talk in my ear while I'm doing this. He could have done that, and he didn't. But anyway, my point is, I was approached by a wrestler that's been in a business for, for quite some time. And I'm in the line with Joe, and I looked at Joe, and I went, Joe, real gingerly, I'm like, what do you think of so-and-so being inducted in the Hall of Fame? And he went, no. I went, oh, no? He goes, no. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> then when, when, then when, I think it was Big Daddy got in, in the Guardian of Chaos, Big Daddy, um, I got inducted to the Hall of Fame. I go, oh my God, I can't wait to tell him. And Joe goes, Mario. I go, yeah, Joe. He goes, I am the only one that notifies people that they're being inducted into the Hall of Fame. And I went, oh, sorry, Joe. Uh, okay. <laughs> so he really is. He really runs a tight ship. He really does. He, he is. So I'm a little nervous when he says it's the last one because Joe's, Joe's probably he sticks to his word there. Let's hope he doesn't this time. But well, if it is the last one, the, the group of Hall of Famers from that Hall of Fame will, will be closed forever, and you'll be one of the the lucky ones that have the been alumni. Done. The alumni, exactly. yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's a bunch of fan questions already. I think these uh, these fans missed you. But uh, someone brings up Barry Harwich. He's coming on this channel on the Great North Wrestling Podcast with Jack Kilby uh, soon. Any memories of him? I got a lot of memories of, of Barry Horowitz. Barry Horowitz, uh, probably one of the most underrated wrestlers in, in, in pro wrestling, except by, by us. You know, guys like Bret Hart and uh, far be it for me. He was, listen, I sit out on every podcast. He's way better than me. His talent far exceeded mine. <laughs> he was a great worker, man. He was really, really good. Um, you know, and he, he was a humble guy in the dressing room. Um, you know, and he was just a consummate pro. He took care of his business. He he, didn't, he wasn't into any shenanigans or anything like that. He he just took care of his business, and he was he was a mechanic in the ring. It, listen, it, it, kind of Bret Hart like, you know what I mean? It, it's the, the days back in the eighties when you cared about the product in the ring, you cared about the wrestling. You know, I, I told my students on Monday night, I said, listen, I realized as the owner of Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling, I, you know, I don't want to hurt these kids, so I got to keep up. You know what I mean? So I, when I broke into wrestling, I broke into the wrestling business, pro wrestling. These kids today are breaking into the entertainment business. So there's a big difference. There's there's a huge difference. Um you know, I, I had a student on FaceTime. Uh, stick a fork in me. And was, <laughs> what match was that? It was that Gorilla Monsoon, right? What match was that, Chris? I remember I, that I remember line, that. actually, but I forget the match. <laughs> you can stick a fork in me now. I'm still done. Um yeah, but Barry was just, he 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 belongs in the Hall of Fame. He belongs in the WWE Hall of Fame. Um, he just you know he I, I'm not going to call him an enhancement talent. He he's too good for that. He's one of those few enhancement talents that um, probably aside from the Brooklyn Brawler, who who by the way I did a job for him, and he was when his first gimmick first came out, he was over. So. You, you know, you really can't call him an enhancement talent. You could call him an enhancement talent when he was Steve Lombardi. But, you, you know, he got the gimmick of the Brooklyn Brawler. Aside from that, you know what I mean? Horowitz had his own. I was afraid to do anything on TV. Horowitz would come right on there and pat himself on the back. 
you know, he's got a T-shirt with a handprint on the back of it. That's genius. You know what I mean? Um, this is how bad it was for me. This is what scared me. This is what scared me. So back in the day, people, I'll get to all your questions. Just let me tell the story. <laughs> back in the day, there's only two places you can go. One was for your wrestling trunks. The other was for your boots. Unless you were Randy Savage or somebody and you you had a, a woman who was a costume maker designing your your, your gear. That, that's that's one out of how many. But typically, it was k h Wrestling, Carl, uh, Carl and Hildegard, um, out of Columbus, Ohio, I believe, Johnstown, Ohio, you got your wrestling trunks from. And you got your wrestling boots from one place, and that was being a being a boot company in Paris, Arkansas. So I got a hold of k h and I ordered a pair of Italian flag trunks. Mario Mancini, you know, Italian guy. I'm going to go out with the Italian flag on it. I made the trunks out of an Italian flag. So I put them on in the dressing room, you know, and Sheik was going to the bathroom, walking by me, going to the men's room. And he stopped by and he looked down and he went, hey, hey, brother. I go, yeah, Sheik. He goes, yeah, yeah, you wear Sheik's colors. Those Sheik's colors. I go, Sheik. It's the Italian flag. No, no, brother. They sheiky colors, brother. You can't wear that. I go, chic. It's the Italian flag. Well, like a fourth grader, he goes, Pat, Pat. And I'm like, this, this guy's turning me in. So Pat Patterson comes walking up. He goes, no, no, Mancini, Mancini. What are you, what are the sheiky colors? Uh, you, what are... And Pat looked at my trunks and he goes, you can't wear those. You can't wear those out there. So I took them off. I looked at Salvatore Belomo and I went, hey, Sal. And he turned around and he goes, yeah. I go, you want you want a pair of trunks? 45 bucks. I whipped them at him. He goes, you want any money for it? I go, no, just take them, keep them. They're yours. So far be it for me, I can't even wear trunks out there. I would have been afraid to do anything. I mean, when I was married, <laughs> the first time, when I was, <laughs> I was married the first time, when I would get announced, I'd go like this, even though it was Snooka's thing, I'd go like that really quick with one hand because I told my wife, when you you know you watch the match and you go like that, it's that's for you. So uh, you know I would do that. That's about it. I was afraid to do anything else. They cut the tape. I get back. They yell at me. I don't know. Let alone go like this. So Barry had a good thing going there. You know what I mean? He had, he had like his own little gimmick. You know, I think yeah. very highly of Barry Horowitz. Very, very highly. There, there's a fan on here that that heard a rumor that you trained both Horowitz and Paul Roma. I I can see the confusion with Paul Roma, but maybe you could clear that up for the fans. The great Malenko family. Trained Barry Horowitz. Oh, legends. The last name Malenko is synonymous with the word legend in this in wrestling business. They trained Bar Barry Horowitz and they trained them well. It, it, you know what I mean? Um, they trained Ken Shamrock too, I believe. Yeah, let me explain Roma to you. So let me let me tell the Paul Roma story. <laughs> Well, yeah, I am the only guy that, that dips, and I just, I'm like a lizard. I just hit my tongue and put it in. Anyway, Gino Carabello and I, in 1984, were in um, Trumbull, Connecticut, I think we were. And we're sitting together in the dressing room. Uh, love Chicago, guys. I got a great story about Chicago. I don't know if I can tell it on the air, though. I, I, I don't think I can. Um, so Gino and I are sitting there, and all of a sudden, this little old guy, tiny, five foot two, maybe strolling through the dressing room, and behind him is this mammoth proportion of a guy with a curly perm walking behind him. I go, Gino, look at that guy. 
do you see the shoulders on that guy? I go, you think they have three holes in them? I go, you could go bowling with those shoulders. Holy Jesus. Who is that? He goes, I don't know. The following Saturday, he shows up at the wrestling school. Paul, how are you? I go, uh, Mario Mancini, nice to meet you. He goes, uh, I don't know. This guy said I'd be a good pro wrestler. I go, well, what do you know about pro wrestling? I, he goes, nothing. I go, did you ever watch pro wrestling? He said, no. I go, you know what Argentino Apollo is? He goes, no. I go, you know who Buddy Rogers is? He goes, no. Bruno Sammartino? He goes, I heard the name. So Tony started training him. And Gino and I saw this guy. And after class, we went to him and said, listen, class is Wednesday and Saturday. We'll work with you on Tuesday and Thursday, Gino and I, aside from the school. And he said, okay. I went to wrestling school from October of 1983 to July of 1984. And then I turned pro in July, 10 months. Romo went to wrestling school for six weeks. Six weeks. I said, you're ready to go to TV. Took him to TV. And we were sitting there, and he's looking at all the guys in the dressing room. And Jake is staring him down, something terrible. He goes, who's the skinny guy over there with the cigarette hanging out of his mouth? I go, that's Jake the Snake Roberts. He goes, why is he looking at me like that? I says, because he doesn't look like you. I go, nobody looks like you in here, Roma. No one. Hulk Hogan walks by to go to the bathroom. He goes, who's that? I said, you see Rocky three? Yeah, I don't remember. He goes, I, I watched it, but if he was in it, I go, he was the wrestler that he faced in Rocky. Oh, oh, he goes, okay, who is he? I go, that's the heavyweight champion. He goes, he's fat. I go, I get up from my, I'm sitting right next to him. I get up, I, I squat in front of him and I almost grab his face and go, shh. I go, you're going to get blackballed from this thing before you even start. Before you even start. I said, you can't say that. He is. Look at him. He's a water bag. I go, Rome, you can't say that in here. You don't know how this thing runs. So now he goes out there and he does a job. He goes out there with his maroon boots and his maroon trunks with his curly perm, and he does a job. And he comes back, and he sits next to me, and he's going. And I'm going, what's wrong? He can't beat me. He can't beat me. He can't beat me. I'm going to beat his ass in the parking lot. I go, Ron, you can't do that. I said, it's, it's a work. You can't do that. I go, it's pro wrestling. You got to pay your dues. He can't beat me. He can't beat. I should get up and kick the shit out of him right now. And what I didn't know, because I didn't know him that well, it was all about his father. He couldn't bear for his father to see him with his shoulders against the canvas. And I didn't know that at the time. Because his father was like mine, like my dad, my World War II veteran dad may rest in peace was my hero okay my father was my hero hands down and his father was too and again i got in front of him and i squatted down i said look look at me they can't deny you they can't not with that body they can't it's only a matter of time now this is an 18 year old kid telling him this 18. i broke in july roman came in in december of 84. I'm like, they can't deny you, Paul. It's impossible. And then shortly after that, they put him with SD and he started going over SD Jones. Then they put him with Powers. That didn't work out. And then they put him with Ray. They put him with Herc. But here's the answer to your question. After I told you that whole Roman story, he learned the minimum. 
now that I look at it, at that wrestling school, who really honestly taught Roma how to work was Mr. Fuji. He spent a lot of time with him, and he trained Roma. And he helped train me, too. I remember when Fuji watched Roma and I go over the top rope for the first time. He goes, who the hell taught you that? I said, Tony Altamar. That when you go over the top rope, you hug the top rope and land on the apron of the ring. He goes, no. You have to clear the whole top rope and go onto the floor. And I'm like, dude, how do you do that? And, you know, and he, he taught us. Fuji should get 95% of the credit for training Paul Roma because that's who trained Paul Roma. Yeah, not uh, not Tony Altamar. And you only Mr. hear the negative stuff about Mr. Fuji, which, which some of these rib stories I don't even know if I believe, like the cooking of the dog, but – you always hear that he would rib the young, the young guys, but you're saying he actually helped uh, you and Paul Roma. Oh, oh, listen, Fuji was in love with Roma, in love. He loved, he loved them. You know, if you get Roma on a podcast, he'll tell you the Tiger Chung Lee story. You know what I mean? Um, Fuji watched out for him like Strongbow watched out for me. Fuji was Roma's Strongbow. You know what I mean? He. He watched out for him. It, Fuji liked me too, and and yeah, he did a lot of ribs. Look, he padlock, lock, he put padlocks around every loop of my pants. I had to rip off every loop to get the, to put my pants on. You know what I mean? If he didn't like, he'd shit in your bag. Um, but you, you know, Fuji was you know somebody got hot. At, I forgot who it was. Roma would know. Somebody got really hot at Fuji one night in the dressing room. And he, they, they, they went, go ahead. I'm going up to him. And somebody looked at him and said, do it. Go ahead. Go up to him. Go up to him. He'll slice you in a million pieces. He'll slice you in a million pieces right there. You got blades on him. He'll slice you to pieces right in this dressing room. Go ahead. Go up to him. He wouldn't go up to him. He wouldn't go up to him. You know, so it is, listen, it, it, as I explained to my students, it's all about respect. As I tell parents, when they bring underage kids in to join the school, when I say underage, they're 16, 17 years old. And if there's a behavioral problem, it'll get fixed because the respect required in professional wrestling, it pales in comparison to like martial arts. And that's supposed to be a very disciplined, you know, thing pales in comparison to the respect that's required in professional wrestling. And that's why Andre liked me. That's why Fuji liked me because, you know what? I kept my mouth shut. I did my job. I didn't complain. And I did what I was told, no matter what it was. If you think I wanted to go to Canada and get cow tied <coughs> like a steer around my wrists and around my ankles by the Funk Brothers, have my trunks pulled down and have my ass branded FB, Jimmy Jack Funk, Dory Funk Jr., and Terry Funk. If you think I wanted that, you're wrong. But you know what? I did it, and I kept my mouth shut. And prayed to God my father didn't see it on TV. So, you know, that's the way it goes. There, there's a couple people mentioned Paul Roma and Alex Wright in WCW. Is there something I never heard of between those two? Well, the thing about that was... Um, you know, Ro listen, it, it's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard to um, narrow it down to business with Roma because we're so close. Um, I've been there for the worst parts, some of the worst parts at times in his life. He's been there for me. You know, um, well, last year I lost the, uh, the second toe on my right foot over something stupid. No people, it wasn't diabetes, something stupid. Uh, and they had to take my toe off and he was right here in my living room. You know, he'd go into the store for me and getting, you know, I told him the restaurant, go to restaurant depot and get me 40 pounds of chicken breast. He's coming in with this big box and, you know, he'll constantly say to me, you know, uh, you know, you need anything, you call me. We live four minutes from each other. And it, even when I go and see my daughter in Presque Isle, Maine, you know, eight and a half hours away in Presque Isle, um, 
you know, he'll call me six o'clock on the way home, knowing that I got another six hours to go and go, listen, man, if you get tired, call me, you know, we're, 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 we watch each other's backs. You know what I mean? So it's hard to do business, but you got to remember something when it comes to Alex Wright and when it comes to the WCW and Paul Roma, if, so let me break it down to business. I'll try, although it wouldn't be like this. It's just an example. If I tell Paul Roma, Come here eight o'clock on Thursday and I'll have five hundred dollars for you. And he comes here at eight o'clock on Thursday and I have three fifty. He's not gonna be happy because he's gonna go. You told me to come here Thursday night at eight o'clock. You have five hundred for me. Say, well, I only have three fifty. Well, that's not what you told me. And basically, that's his personality. So when he goes to WCW, they told him a certain thing, and now he's paid his dues in his business broken neck, the whole nine yards, you know, he's been places, <laughs> he's been over, you know, you know, Roma, when Roma compares other wrestlers, when he compares other, you know, wrestlers to, to when they think they're too big, some of these wrestlers, you know, I'm standing there in a wrestling school like this. And Roma's like, well, who the hell is this guy? Who, let, let me ask you a question. Roma goes, who did he ever beat? And I go, look over at Rome. I go, whoa, go easy with that beat stuff. Easy. Who did he ever beat? And he starts laughing his ass off because I didn't beat anybody. <laughs> so they all beat me. So I go, go easy with that. Who did he beat stuff? So, um, you know, WCW told him one thing. And then Alex Wright, I never met the man, but he's like at, uh, 18, 19 years old. And the deal was Roma would never do a job on a pay-per-view ever. And then they're telling him to go out there and do a job for Alex Wright. Well, he old schooled it. You know what I mean? He did what anybody with pride and, and of, of his career and in the work he's put in. And he went out there and, 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 you know, he gave him the Gaga a strong bow would say. He came the Gaga. And you know what? To this day, um, I don't know who that is. Um, Finney this, is Godwin. He was later Midian. I, I don't know. Who, I don't know. Who that, was he a good-looking guy, Grandma? <laughs> I'll because, find a picture, but we don't mean to interrupt you. Well, Grandma, don't – please, don't make me – listen, I got low self-esteem as it is. Um so he 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 uh are, all right well there you go has he was he was uh he was 18 i mean roma roma gave him the business you know what i mean he's not you know he's paul roma you know he's got the highest drop kick in professional wrestling history jo he drop kick big john stud his left foot was on his forehead and his right foot was over his head said john stud was 6 6 8 6 9 maybe even 6 10 you know what I mean? Roma was one of the first wrestlers I've ever seen. I've never seen another one climb the top rope, no hands. Paul Roma is the greatest athlete I've ever seen in my life. And that that is all sports. Also, I don't care, Jordan, and he's the greatest at what I seen him do in wrestling school. The front desk, it was one of those front desks, you know, Hannibal at the gym, it comes up to your chest. It's not waist high. It's one of those desks. You know, you've seen them. They come up to here. You know, they might be four and a half feet high, whatever. Roma would, would, first he would leap the couch like the Hulk. He would just leap the couch and go to the other side. And then he would leap and put and stand on top of the counter. So this guy was so agile. For his weight and the way he looked, he was like a feather. This guy was like a feather. I've never seen anybody with those leaping abilities in my life. I mean, it was, it, you know, it was incredible. He's like the Lynn Swan of wrestling. You know, he was incredible. And just an incredible, incredible worker. Just an incredible athlete. You know, and the only reason why I didn't play for the New York Jets is because he was going to kick the shit out of Mark Gastineau and Joe Klecko. He tried out for them. They made a real snide comment to him in the dressing room. He went after him. <laughs> the Jets were interested in him because he was quick, fast. I mean, fast, fast.
fast. So was this in the ring or in the dressing room where where they had this incident with all him and Alex? Right? Yeah. Well, you watch the whole match. You being a pro wrestler yourself, you'll be able. Yeah, you'll be able to pick up where he he, he's kind of not cooperating. And after that, the, the WCW let him go. And he, you know what? Ask me if Roma cared. He didn't care at all. He didn't care at all. Didn't care at all. He didn't care at all. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised by that. No. Apparently, it was WCW Super Brawl '95. I guess I'll look it up. the The guy from Chicago really wants you to tell the Chicago story. Oh, brother, that's a rough story, man. That's a rough... You know, I'll tell the... It's not as funny if I keep the name out. It's not funny. It's not... F- <laughs> I can't I can't tell the give story. A, give the us only, a hint at who it might be. The only thing I, I can't... I can't tell that story. He's got kids and stuff. I can't what does it story. involve? <laughs> oh, listen. It was... It was... Um, I'll do the voice. If you guys can figure it out, God bless you. So um, we were in Chicago. And um, <laughs> yeah, Brian, we we're in Chicago and, and we got done. And it was one of those rare times where, I, you know, I didn't book a hotel. I figured I'm in Chicago. There'll be a million of them. Don't worry about it. Right. There wasn't. They were all sold out, and I was I was with Joe Murdo, Joe Mur. I love Joe Murdo. I was so mad when they let him go. I got in an argument with Strongbow. He told me mind my own business <laughs> when they let Joe Murdo go. Another job, no, a gentle giant man. He was just a nice guy. So this other wrestler comes home. <laughs> he goes, hey, 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 you guys got a room? I went, no, no, we're, we're, we're looking for, so we go to the, the hotels, you know, around the lake in Chicago, they're, they're sold out. This is before Expedia. And the yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. This is like 85. So he takes us to the South side of Chicago and he takes us to one of these hotels where you, where you can go in and go, yeah, like a short stay for four hours. So now it's two o'clock in the morning. Vince McMahon, um, well, he likes to save money. So you're flying out of O'Hare or Midway at like 6, 12 a.m., you know, in case you guys think, the, unless you're Hulk Hogan or one of the top guys, if you guys think the life of a pro wrestler, boy, did they have fun. You go into the town, right? Especially if you get there at like three o'clock, you, you got a time to check in, take a shower, you know, maybe grab a small bite to eat because you don't want to eat that much. It, you're, the call time is five o'clock to get into the dressing rooms. If you're late, you get your balls busted. So you're in the dressing room by five o'clock. You do the show. You're, you're out by 11 and you're out by 11 and you're back in your hotel room, 11, you know what I mean? Unless you go out with the guys and then (laughs) big daddy, I would never kayfabe you in a million years, the guardian of chaos, big daddy. So another one of my closest brothers. So, so, uh, So you really don't have a lot of time. You know, when I tell people everywhere I've been, they go, oh, did you see this? I go, no, I was in and I was out. So we go to this this hotel and Joe Murdo, I go, Joe, you can sleep for like three hours max. You can be up by five, got to get to the airport, maybe two and a half, two and a half hours. And the funny part about it is, is saying the guy's name that's the funny part about it and i can't i I can't number one he's passed away number two he's got kids i can't do that so what i'll i will do it though i'll do it for you guys all right you guys are spoiled so joe murdo and i are in the room and we're going to sleep and all of a sudden we hear i'm like what are the walls made out of paper 
What do you mean on paper? <sighs> on my chest! On my chest! On my chest! Finally, it's over. I look over at Joe. I go, oh, finally. They're done, right? Just drift off to sleep here. <sighs> Forget about the two hours. We're up. We're just, we're up. We didn't sleep at all. He went the entire time we had to go. It, it, the, the entire time to sleep. By the time he was done, we had to leave. So now we meet downstairs. And he looks, he goes, hey, he's ready to go. And I went, hey, 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 hey. and the girl's like, he's like, oh, you guys heard that all night. Huh? I'm like, yeah, I went, yeah. <laughs> That's my Chicago story. <laughs> One of the times I was there. Anyway. <laughs> that but happened to be a few years ago in Arizona, too, where, where I had a similar thing. Yeah. I had to give the news, though. There was some type of news. And I was in a cheaper hotel and I could hear these people right before I gave the news. And then after I'm like, do I still give it? Cause they're going to be able to hear me. So they're going to know I've heard them. So you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 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 Now you did mention uh, the iron Sheik earlier, the story about the tights. I, I hear there's another one that uh, you told to the cheap heat productions guy, Maurice. That's pretty funny about the 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 airplane story. Could you oh. share that for those that haven't heard? <laughs> so the Sheik, I wasn't there, but you know what? Seven different guys told me the story. Roma loves this story. It's one of his favorite stories. She gets on the airplane. He walks down. He he knows he has a middle seat. There's a woman sitting on the end, the end seat. He didn't care about the window seat. He wanted the end seat. So he looks at the older woman and he goes, excuse me, ma'am. I am the Iron Sheik WWF champion. Uh, I have middle seat. Do you, do you mind if I take your seat and that you sit in the middle? Sheiky's big guy. You, you mind? And she goes, you know. Ma'am, please. I am the Iron Sheik. WWF champion. Please. I, if you can move, I, I appreciate it. Then please. She goes, no. He goes, oh, you fucking bitch. You fucking whore motherfucker. Mother. Starts calling all these things. And she starts screaming, and the flight attendants come running there, and they go, "What's wrong? What's wrong?" And she goes, "He just called me a bunch of horrible names." And they looked at him. And he goes, "I speak no English." <laughs> He's speaking no English. Oh God, that's where the kayfabe uh, could come to the advantage. Uh, I've heard you talk about rats on, on other podcasts, and someone has a question here. Did Allentown or Harrisburg have better arena rats, which are, are called groupies now? They're, we don't use, use the rat term as much. You, you know, I, I don't, I, you know, guys, I think that's a real uh, hell of a question. I mean, I'm going to tell you this. Of course, there were groupies um, back in. I think there were a lot more groupies back in the 80s than there are now. But Because um, the, the most of the audience is men now, sadly. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> there, are, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of them. And you, you know what, guys? And I hate to pop your bubble and go, oh, man, see you let us down. But, you know, these women are, they're mothers now. <laughs> They have grandkids, you know what I mean? In case I was with anybody in Pennsylvania and they watch this podcast, I don't want anybody to call me a mother effer or anything like that. Or I don't, you know, I don't, you know, they're, they were everywhere. They were, they were, they were everywhere. Was there so, one town more than, than another in the whole, in, in all the places you wrestled? 
Um, um, uh, Ohio. Um, <laughs> all right. So, listen, I actually ended up falling in love with one in Cal with with a fan in California when she was 18 years old <laughs> you know um still talk to her today and you know still have feelings for her so it's it's it, and that was you know 1987 I was 21 years old um there was this one girl in Columbus, Ohio. And I tried to get her all night. And the hotel was connected to a restaurant. So all I do is leave the restaurant, go up to my room. And I tried to get her all night. She goes, I'm, and it was a house show. So she's like, I'm waiting for Brett. I'm like, hon, did you go to the show? No. I go, Brett's not here. He wasn't booked on the show. He's, he's not here. Oh, so I'm working her and working her and working her and working her. And she's, I'm like, why don't you come up to my room with me? I'm waiting for Brett. And, you know, she was, she was Mancini all day long. You know what I mean? Five, four, about buck 45 buck 55 you know if you know i'm sir mix a lot you know if you're five foot three 110 pounds just keep on walking you know what i mean so it's like well you know come up and now i'm waiting for brett i got i don't know how many times i'm gonna tell you brett's not here so i was rooming with somebody else so i'll i'll re he'll, he'll he'll remain nameless so i got frustrated and i gave her my room number and i went screw it Screw it. It's 1 30 in the morning. I, you know, we were, we were going, um, I don't know if we were going to Indiana after that. I don't know where the hell we were going, but I said, I'm going to bed. About 40 minutes later, my, the phone rings in my room. And the, the guy on the other end of the phone who remained nameless. They burned her. Come down. She's all ready. I go, no, I don't want her like that. She goes, no, they, she got burned. Come on. They age bombed her, you know. <laughs> they age bombed her in her drink. She's ready, Mancini. Come on down. I go, no, no, I'm going to bed. So the next morning, I, you know, we got up and we did, went down for breakfast. And there she was all disheveled. Still in the same clothes. She slept in the lobby. She didn't know what happened because she got H bomb. She passed out in the lobby and she goes, I went to find your room last night, but I lost the paper that you gave me. <laughs> oh my God, son of a bitch. And the guy I'm with, he's like, I told you to come back down. I go, no, uh, uh, no, I don't, you know, I don't want it like that. I don't, I don't H bomb people. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that seemed to happen. A lot Frequently. of days, and there. Yeah, yeah. One yeah. of the one of the people known for that is actually still with with the company. Yeah. <laughs> but we we won't get into that. that right now, there's some certain things you can't get into. Uh, but but speaking uh, of those type of things, uh, since I last interviewed you, Vince McMahon, I guess, settled that uh, Rita Chatterton referee case for according to the wall street journal several million and I, I know you were close with her and you were following that situation what do you think all these years later she's collecting on that uh alleged incident well you know it's it's no it's no secret that i'm very close to rita um i mean she she walked into quest gym to be a female referee she walked into the wrestling school you know, I've known her since, you know, her, her first class, you know. Um, the one thing I want to say is I don't care about the money that she got. What I care about is the exorcism. That's what I care about. Um, she had to live with it for 36 years. 
And, um, you know, I am the in the business of, of law. I did graduate from law school and I've been with a law firm for 28 years. And what I like to say to clients, um, you know, it's a personal injury law firm. What I like to say to clients when their cases settle is, you know, I hope um, I hope you think your settlement is, you know, is fair and you were fully compensated for what you went through. And that's the only thing I can hope for Rita to exercise that demon. Maybe she can sleep a little better at night. Maybe she can have some closure um, and that she feels that she's been fairly compensated um, for what had happened. If I know, if I, I know Rita well, and I haven't, I haven't spoken to her in a while. Um, you know, if I know her, she would, she probably would look at me and go, you know, Lenny, a hundred million couldn't have, couldn't have done that. But, and I realize that I realize that when a woman goes through something like that, I get it, but I'm just hoping that it, it you know, it does give her some peace and, um, and, and gives her some closure. Do you still remain in contact with her here and there? Well, 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 yeah. I mean, um, you know, the the Wall Street Journal got a hold of me, and and you know, New York Magazine did an article on me last year, and I did do um, the Nine Lives of Vince McMahon. They took an ex excerpt out of uh, Cheap Heat with Maurice, and. Um, and um, I, I did do another documentary that I, I, it, that's still in pre-production. Pre so, um, you know, don't forget when all this happened in 86, she told two people. She told Andre the Giant and she told me. And Andre's dead. And um, I did what I felt was morally right. And I did what I felt. I wanted to do for my friend, you know, there were other, other opinions from other people in the business that, you know, Vince is going to hate you. And if uh, there's a fifth edition in the, the WWE encyclopedia, you're not going to be in it. And if they ever open up a wing for the hall in the hall of fame for jobbers, you're not getting inducted. And, you know, but I hit my pillow at night and I know I, I did the right thing. You know what I mean? Because the question that was posed to me through this whole thing was, did she tell you? And that's the question. Not the facts of it. The question that was posed to me is, did she communicate this to you in 86? And, it, and the answer is yes. Now, you can Vince can deny the allegation, and he has, and whatever. But the question was, did she communicate this to you in 86? And the answer is yes, she did. So um, I'm just a little nervous because, I, you know, I, I hope I'm, I'm good standing with my brothers because they mean a lot to me. You know what I mean? Like Greg Valentine and Beefcake and Demolition and Tito Santana and Tony Atlas and, you know, um, all, all the guys, Ted DiBiase all the guys that I see at the conventions, you know, I, I would be mortified if I went to get my hug and they just kind of turned their back on me because, you know, I, I, to me, I did the right thing. You know what I mean? So anybody who was following it closely, always saw my name come up, you know, if they watch Cornette, you know, Cornette's mentioned a couple of times that look, and she told Andre and Mario Mancini. And like I said, I would, it was set on the nine lives of Vince McMahon. If, if anybody watched that and had cheap heats clip on it. And, and, um, so, you know, I, I, I did, the, I did the right, I, I don't, I don't contact her. I, I didn't ask her about it, you know, or what happened or anything like that. I, I saw it on, the, on social media that it settled and, you know, I figure in time, you know, whenever that'll be, you know, um, she'll reach out to me whenever. I, I don't know. Um, uh, so if, if, if plus, if I'm right, 
which, like I said, I've been in this profession for 20 years. Whatever she signs, she probably can't even talk about it. So even when we, it, the time comes when we do talk, it's going to probably be small talk because she's she probably can't talk about it. So. And I, I know your answer to this because I'm sure you would have been more discreet than to be be doing this. But this fan wants to know if you ever saw Vince smash anyone. He was with Linda, wasn't he married to Linda for for decades? Yeah, but they haven't been together in years. Um, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that it, according to what we know, that it's. Well, well, like well, well, I don't. I don't understand the term "smash." What does "smash" mean? Uh, it's a term for bang or, or no, fuck or no, sex no, 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 no. Now, now, speaking of the Jobber Hall of Fame, I did. Uh, there was a great North Wrestling podcast over the weekend with Reno Riggins, and he brought up an Enhancement Talent Hall of Fame. And I noticed when he named off, it seemed like it wasn't with me. It was with Jack Kilby, and he named off about 10 that he felt should be in there. Your name wasn't in his his 10, but your name would be in most people's. Did you know Reno Riggins, or was he after your time just coming in? As I, knew, uh, I, knew, I knew Reno. Uh, I knew all of them. Um, and I think I was in a dressing room with him. Um, you're bringing some heat, though, if Maurice is watching this, because I think we're supposed to do a, a podcast together, a, a cheap heat podcast together, and he never mentioned my name for that Hall of Fame. So it looks like there's some heat there between us before this podcast even starts, Maurice. There's looks a like you're you're, you're going to have some cheap heat. <laughs> so yeah, well, um, I noticed it, too, just because you've been so popular on this, this channel that uh, he named some people I hadn't even heard of. And I was keep I was waiting. It's like, okay, is he going to name Mario? He named well, listen, I, well, listen, I made a, a a job or Hall of Fame, and I didn't even put myself on it. You know what I mean? I didn't even put myself on it. Um, there's so many other guys before me that should be there. Um, you know, you, you got Frank Williams, you got Omar Atlas, you, you got Jose Estrada, Jose Luis Rivera. Um, well, Johnny Rods is the only enhancement talent that's that's in there uh it, he is in the hall of fame uh johnny rods um you know you have uh um iron mike sharp you know sd jones he you left know, out uh, mike sharp too mike sharp but, uh, mike sharp actually started with a bit of a push didn't he yeah he did yeah. he did mike sharp um um terry gibbs uh, Charlie Fulton. Yeah, you know, there, there's so many other guys um, that w that would be deserve to be there um, before me. You know what I mean? Um, guys in the '70s. You know, um, early '80s that. Uh, That really should be. You got Rick McGraw, you know. He, although he was over sometimes, but you know, there's so many, there's so many other guys. I think even if you weren't a, as talented a, as you were, just for having the Undertaker's first match and a lot, a lot of people's first match, you might hold the record for being the guy to have the most super future superstars debut match in WWE. So that, well, that might put you in by default. But you got enough fan questions on here for an entire another hour. So I'll limit it to, to two more from people that have been patient. Uh, someone wanted to know with all the negative stuff about Chief J Strongbow out there uh, from your colleagues um, and you speaking so highly of him, why do you think so many people had negative opinions of him? Um, because they probably didn't like what he had to say. Um, I, I can't comprehend that. Um, I, I can't comprehend that, uh, because, uh, chief was everything to me. He was my second dad and, um, he watched out for me and, 
you could you you guys have all the right to say, well, you know, Mario, you were you were a, a, a tiny little tadpole in this huge ocean, you know, maybe you know, Strongbow, you know, patted you on the head and took care of you, and you're probably right, you know, you're you're probably right, but Chief was kind of like Andre. If Chief loved you, he loved you. If he didn't, he didn't. And there'd have to be a reason. See, Chief had a lot of moral character. See, Chief was a stand-up guy. And if you were a stand-up guy, then you got along with him. If you were somebody who made trouble, spread rumors, you're always in the drama, you're always getting heat on people, Chief want nothing to do with you. Because you, you're you're just a you know spreading too much gaga and you, you know your focus is is on the wrong thing, you know what I mean. So you know it's like the first day in the dressing room, July thirty first eighty four, and I said, w w Mr. Strongbow, what would you like me to do? And he said, See that chair, see that chair, sit there and keep your mouth shut. Just shut up. I said, Okay. And you know what? I don't lie on podcasts. That's always my rule. I don't, I tell the truth no matter what. Maybe that's why you guys like me so much. But the fact that he was Italian and I'm Italian probably had something to do with it too. But I know another man that will remain nameless that I had the honor and privilege of meeting who reached out to me, you know, and his chief's best friend, you know, his best friend. Amazing. You know, he sent me a pair of chief's trunks. I'm going to put in a jersey frame. Um, Chokes me up, chokes me up. But and even in Brett's book, he he had a rough start with him. But in the, I think overall, for all the stories that Brett tells in his book about Chief, he kind of praises him in the end. You know, because you know, Chief, you know, Chief was a god. Chief was. A, I come back to the ring and a house show, and Chief go, come here, come here. Why do you take so many bumps? In a house show, I go, oh, Chief, I like taking bumps. Man, stupid kid, you know what I mean? I like taking bumps, Chief. I love it. Hey, you're not going to love it when you get older. He goes, you know, use your head in there. Use your head. You know, and it wasn't until, guys, it wasn't until social media that I really understood what he meant. It wasn't until social media, until I knew. And I tell him, I go, I understand now, Chief, because I watched his match, his comeback match after his leg healed, that Valentine broke in 1979. And it was the rematch. And Chief, you guys have to know that if I'm wrestling you in a house show, we go to the agent, we see who's over, which is probably you. <laughs> Just probably you. But how long? 11 minutes. Okay. That clock starts the minute you go through the curtain. Not when the bell rings. The time of the match starts when you leave the curtain. Not when the bell rings. So now Chief. Chief stood outside the ring. Staring at Valentine. It's got to be three minutes. Just staring at him. Staring, staring at him. He's not doing anything. Nothing. Nothing. He's not doing anything. Just staring at him. Staring at him. And Vince is putting it over. Strong ball, giving him the look down. He's staring at Valentine down. Oh, his eyes won't leave him. His eyes won't leave him. Look at Chief staring down Valentine. Now, in the way of psychology, there's one of two ways of doing this on a revenge match. Either you do what Chief did and steer him down to intimidate him, or you come running from the curtain in the ring and just start hammering the guy because it's a revenge match. Right? Chief is just staring him down. And then he gets in the ring, and 
you know, he starts dancing toward him and stuff like that. Well, you know, well, for God's sakes, they, they really didn't do anything for uh, like five minutes into the match. So the question that was posed on a Q&A run by Howard Finkel, it was, <laughs> I had no right being up there. I had no right being up. Listen to this. <laughs> no, I sat up there going, what the hell am I doing up here? God bless Joe Bruin. It was, here's the lineup. Harley Race, <laughs> Tito Santana, myself, Matt Stryker, Craig Valentine, your Davy Boy Smith's wife, a couple other people. So you could ask anything you want in this intimate question and answer session. So a fan looked, said that the how the Howard Finkel goes, Greg to Greg Valentine. You had a rivalry with Strongbow. What is the biggest thing you learned working with Chief J Strongbow? And he said, the biggest thing I learned working with Chief J Strongbow was that less is more. Less is more. And Chief got over, you know, as far as dealing with him, if Chief's got a bad story about you, especially a story of dishonesty, he, he's going to come in with, with an idea about you to begin with. You're, you're in the hole already. You know what I mean? If, it, if it's a story of dishonesty or you screwed somebody over or you stole money or anything like that, he's not going to be happy. And you're not going to start out on the right foot. He can be very critical about your work in the ring. And maybe guys took offense to that. You know what I mean? But I, I don't know who. He, listen. You guys want a good taste of uh, uh, Jay Strongbow and who's supposed to hate him? He fired David Schultz. He fired David Schultz in Los Angeles. Had him cuffed, arrested, and taken away. I welcome all of you guys to buy Don't Call Me Fake by David Schultz. He praises him throughout the whole book. Is nothing but praise for Jay Strongbow. And, and last question, as I said, there, there's enough to fill another well, two hours. Well, 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 let's go, Hannibal. Yeah, I've, let's I've, do I've, ten of them. Yeah, I'd rather make them wait and get you in, in smaller. Part five. <laughs> Part but, five. Uh, but, but Rick Rude, Reno Riggins told the story about Rick Rude being really rough. Did, did you ever wrestle him or hear those rumors? Yeah, Rick Rude was my last match in the WWF. He's the last guy I worked with, then I left. before That was in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, the night before that was in Nashville, Tennessee with uh, Wayne, with the Honky Tonk Man. But Rick Rude was my last match in the WWF. And he wasn't stiff with me at all whatsoever at all you got to be you got to remember something at that point i was there for eight years so he saw me constantly in the dressing room you know and and you know again truthfully um truthfully when these guys came in for the first time like when i worked with taker and we were going over the match you know and basically going over the match was he was going to close line me over the top rope backwards. I needed to keep my elbow stiff because he was going to walk the top rope in the, in the finish. We didn't sit there and go over every single thing. Just didn't do that. Not in those days. He doesn't know me. Even though I told him I was there for six years, he doesn't know me. No, no, no concussions for me out. So I tucked my chin. Got to tuck your chin. So, Strongbow always made it a habit like he did with Bundy when I did Bundy's debut match in March of 85 to come up and go, put his arm around me and go, it's a good kid. He's good. He's really good. And they go, oh, okay. That's what Strongbow did for him. He's, he's good. He's going to get you over. Even though Chris, Bundy was so, he was so nervous. <laughs> He's stiff as hell anyway. But, listen, he became one of my closest friends. I miss him so much. Um, he was stiff anyway, that March of 85 match. That was, that was three months before my 19th birthday. <laughs> 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 
But Rick Rude, Rick Rude was was always nice to me. Uh, he worked fine in the ring with me. wasn't stiff at all. Um, not none whatsoever. None whatsoever. His his wife was one time though. When she came on the road, he didn't know it. Oh. I, I, I guess one of those after the match, he'd get get the woman in and kiss him, and they faint or something, right? So the camera came too close one time, and the two tongues were going like this. He was kissing the girl. So his wife had watched that on the late tape, and she shot out without him knowing <laughs> to wherever he was and went to the dressing room. Because <laughs> she saw those two tongues going when he kissed her. <laughs> yeah, because the kiss was just supposed to be a work, and that one wasn't a work. That's got to be embarrass embarrassing. By the way, Midian is this guy here. He's actually a cook now, so you have that in common. You know, I met him at Think. When I did Think Signatures, they were coming in after me. Actually, I had lunch with those guys. So, so yeah, there's not – I could see maybe if you had your hair down and had the makeup on, there'd be a bit of – I don't know. It, well, here's the funny. I'll leave you with the funny. Especially if you look at my shot on Tuesday Night Titans in that gray leisure suit. If you look at me there, um, Roma calls me a chubby Burt Reynolds. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's a compliment. In a yeah. <laughs> now, Paul, Paul is at your wrestling school now. I know he's going to call you again soon. So we, yeah, yeah, we don't want it on his bad side. Yeah. Um, but you want to plug your wrestling school and what, what events do you have coming up? Well, let me tell you something. We just had a sold out event this last Saturday. Really, really never. I haven't, I have to say, I haven't, I haven't seen anything like that in a while. We had actually um, had, had to put a sign on the door that said sold out. You know, um, it, it was, uh, I'm going to see Big Daddy tomorrow night, the Guardian of Chaos. Guys, you want to see some good stuff? You want me to plug something? The Guardian of Chaos is all over YouTube, man. He's got some good stuff you 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 want to see. Check out the Guardian of Chaos, Big Daddy on on YouTube. He's got a lot of good stuff going on there. Um, it was a sold out show. Uh, Rome is back to booking, so he's back to booking and doing the storyline. So it was, you know, some I really enjoyed some of the finishes he set up. Um, we have a show coming up on fe February eighteenth. The wrestling school is exploding. I, I don't know what it is. I, I, you know, I, I, I'm thankful. Don't get me wrong. I'm thankful. Uh, but with the economy it is and everything, people just keep, come one after another. I want to be a wrestler. I want to be a wrestler. I want to be. And uh, to my knowledge, we're the only uh, wrestling school in um, the country, I think. I, don't quote me. I don't want to get emails or, or the, you're wrong, Mario. You're But. It's myself, Paul Roma, Big Steve Tracy, who worked in the WWF as Dave Paradise, and Paul Perez are the four partners at Paradise Alley, and all four of us are former WWE wrestlers. Um, so it, it's Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling. You can check us out on ParadiseAlleyProWrestling.com. We're at 662 Co. Avenue in East Haven, Connecticut, and um, uh, we're very honest at Paradise Alley. And what do I mean by that? When you when you join the wrestling school, you start out with me. Why? Because I'm going to teach you how to fall. Could you think of anybody else, if you want to be a pro wrestler, who you want to teach you how to fall? But Mario Mancini is going to teach you how to fall. Teach you how to do bumps, beals, hit the ropes, turnbuckles, um, chain wrestling, um, drop downs, tackles, hip tosses, suplexes, uh, slams. When when everybody can put that together, I let them loose the Roma on Wednesdays and Saturdays or the more advanced classes. Because if I had if I had five hundred matches, Roma had five thousand. You know what I mean? And you know he did a lot more wrestling than me. He's got a lot more psychology than I do. They go on to him and they get polished. He teaches them drop kicks, leap frogs, how to climb the ropes, jump off the top, psychology after psychology after psychology, kicks, punches, you know, all the all the rest of it. So we really do have a good partnership. We know our roles. We know who we were. 
<laughs> and we know our roles. So, um, you know, that's that's Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling. So if you want to be a pro wrestler, uh, you know, come on down. There you go. And you can also be found on, on Facebook. Paul Roma is on Facebook, too. Yeah. And, and I think we'll definitely have to ho- hopefully have you back again. For part five. Yeah, well, for like, part- I, like I always say, and you know what, Hannibal, it happened. Don't think it didn't happen because it did. So I'll say it again. Um, unless you're a really hot looking woman, um, unless you're a really hot looking woman and you friend request me. And then when I look at the profile, everybody's from Nigeria. I'm probably going to delete that. Other than that, <laughs> you know, I, I really don't, um, I, I really don't, um, refuse anybody's friend request if you're a wrestling fan or anything. And, and your friend requests me on Facebook. I think I got, I'm up to like 4,400 friends or something. I only have 600 left, but I usually, you know, people inbox me on instant messenger first and go, Hey Mario, I saw you on Hannibal, you know, um, I friend requested you. I go, okay, boom. And I hit accept and I'm on Instagram. Uh, I don't really know how to use Twitter, although I'm on it. I have no idea. I, I really don't look at it often, but mainly it's, it's, um, it's Facebook and Instagram. Um, but if you want to check out Paradise Alley, come on down. We're, we're there. Or if you just want to come to a show, you know what I mean? We're there. Yeah. And you actually have enough clips on this channel now that I, that I even made a playlist for you. So you're, you're one of the few that have a playlist that that I just put the link in to people (laughs) for all the clips of you talking, but, uh, Glad to see you're doing well, and you had a sellout, and Paul Roma is doing well, and your whole team. Yeah. So yeah. I'll let you close this off with uh, whatever you want to say on this this first interview of February, probably for both of us. Yes. Listen, as usual, I, I appreciate you guys watching. I appreciate your comments. Um, listen, I'll give you the answer. I won three matches. Gino Carabello was September 11th, 1986 in the New Haven Coliseum. That was 20 minutes from my house. You know, that was incredible. Incredible. That I mean, the, the roar of the crowd was deafening. Um, I, uh, I had a victory in Middletown over uh, uh, Venom, this guy, Venom. And then I had... I had a victory in a tag team match with Sweet, only because I was tag teaming with Sweet Hansen. So I actually took the 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 um, I actually took the heat and he got the hot tag and had the he did the pinning. I, I just stood there and went like this with Sweet. So uh, three matches I won in the WWF and um, I regret nothing. If I if I went all the way back to July 31st, 84, my first day in the dressing room, um, I and they said, listen, the same thing's going to happen all over again. I go, OK, you know, I just had a great time. You got to remember, other than doing jobs and wrestling and house shows and all that stuff, it, it was the camaraderie I enjoyed and the friendships I created over these past 39 years. Next year, I'll be my celebrate my 40th year. And it's because of you guys. Um, And I appreciate you, um, you know, giving attention to this 56-year-old man who was just some kid from a little town named Milford, Connecticut, that had a dream of being a professional wrestler at the age of 14. And actually looking at my family saying, I'm going to be a pro wrestler. In 1980, I said, I'm going to be a pro wrestler for the WWWF then. And for it to come true four years later is like unthinkable because we all have dreams. And a lot of times those dreams don't come true. I was fortunate enough to have a dream and it came true. And I appreciate you guys still watching, still being interested, still watching my matches and watching Hannibal and uh, being interested in what I have to say. I thank you. Thank you so much. I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot.